Hey, church, come on, let's stand together. Let's get the morning start off right. It is good to have you here in the house. We're here for a purpose this weekend. We're here to praise his holy name. So come on, let's do that. Here we go. I'll praise in the valley. Praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. Praise when I'm down. I'll praise when I'm numbered. Praise when surrounded. our praise of God today. That is why we are here, Lord, to lift your name high, to exalt you in this place. Because you rose and defeated the grave, God, we celebrate that today in your house. God, be honored in our praises today. I'm calling on the God redeemer, whose love endures through generations.
changes, never changes. You heard your children, then. you hear your children now. You are the same God. You, that's right, He's the same God. You answer prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. Oh, you're the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God. Come on, He wants you to move on. You moved in power then. You moved in power then. God moved in power now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You are a healer then. You are a healer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You are a Savior then. You are a Savior now. You are the same God. You are the same God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. I'm on your faithfulness. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh, 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 that your faithfulness isn't contingent upon circumstances or our feelings, Lord. That you are constant, you are true. So God, whatever I come in here today with, Lord, whatever I'm feeling today, God, thank you, Lord, that you're there. That you can be trusted, you can be dependent upon. Come on, if you need to sing this one more time, just sing it with me. How I need you, Lord. Oh, God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. Oh, I need you now. He's the rock of ages. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. You know, I love that song because it teaches us many things. But what I love about it most is this. That song is a reminder to remember. It's a reminder to remember. To remember that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when it comes to the, the fullness of the story of Scripture, this theme of remembrance is key from start to finish. And in fact, as we move forward in our time together this morning, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna remember. We're gonna remember Jesus' death until he comes again as we come to the Lord's table, as we take communion this morning. So I'm gonna invite you to just grab a seat right where you are, but please remain in an attitude of worship as you do so and locate those communion elements you received as you came into the room this morning. In fact, if you got into the room and you slipped by our ushers and greeters and you didn't receive those elements and you wanna take part in communion, this symbolic meal 
of Jesus's death. If you just raise your hand, we'll have an usher just drop by and get you these elements. Hold that hand high until one of our ushers finds you. Also, let me encourage you with this as well. If you're here this morning and you still got questions about Jesus, what it means to say yes to him, what it means to call him Savior and Lord. Listen, there's no pressure in this moment to take communion. We're glad you're here. Keep coming back. You're going to learn more and more about Jesus if you keep coming to Rock Creek Church. But historically, this symbolic meal communion, it's reserved for those who have said yes to Jesus. They trust Jesus as Savior and Lord of their lives. You know, we're one week away from Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, that most glorious moment in all of human history. And where we stand today is one week before that, one week before the timeline of events. It's what's referred to as Palm Sunday. And here's what happened. One week before Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus rode into Jerusalem and he was celebrated by the people as the Messiah. Uh, they laid down the palm branches in the road before him as he rode into town. And they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But here's the fascinating thing. Uh, within a few days, those same people, those same people, the shouts, they moved from Hosanna, Hosanna to crucify him, crucify him. But God wasn't caught off guard. God had a plan to make the world right through Jesus. And part of that plan was for Jesus to go to the cross, for your sin, for my sin, for the sins of the world. Scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. And when Jesus went to the cross, he took our sin. God made Jesus who never sinned to become sin so we could be then made right with God brought into a right relationship with God. And so as we come to the Lord's table today, it's an act of remembrance, remembering that through Jesus's body and his blood, we are made right with God. But even more than that, this is a time of confession as well, as we come to the Lord's table. And maybe there's some unresolved sin or some unresolved conflict relationally that you bring into this room. And it's a reminder that repentance is a good thing. That, that's the path forward to healing and restoration. And as we come to the Lord's table today, we can find healing and restoration through confession, through repentance. And so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna read some scripture. I'm gonna prompt you on when to take the bread and, and when to take the cup. And then we're gonna worship. We're gonna reflect and worship on what Jesus has done for us. And so in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, the apostle Paul is giving some instructions. He, he's talking on behalf of Jesus, quoting Jesus here as he gives some instructions to a church on how to receive these elements. And so he says this, he says, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may now take the bread. Scripture continues, it says, in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. You may now take the cup. Heavenly Father, we come before you in this moment with thankful hearts, thankful for the blood of Jesus that transforms us from the inside out, that doesn't make us better, it makes us new, a new creation, 
And now as your sons and daughters, we declare that and we celebrate that with glad and sincere hearts. And it's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, let's stand to our feet and continue to worship as we reflect on the blood of Jesus. was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your side. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time.
Father God, today we sing glory to your name. Glory to the name above all names. The name who willingly got up on that cross and shed his blood for each and every one of us in this room and for everyone online today, Lord. That blood that offers grace, that blood that offers atonement, that offers a payment for who we are in our sinful nature. God, today in this house, we lift high the name of Jesus. In that name alone today, in this house, Lord. God, we praise you for who you are. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Hey, before you take your seat, come on, give the Lord some praise in this house today. Come on. Come on, give the Lord some praise. All right, you can grab your seat now if you can find one. And it isn't even Easter yet, man. How good was that worship this morning? That's every week at Rock Creek, is it not? It's every week. Well, welcome, 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 and all of you joining us online, wherever you're watching from, we welcome you to our services today. We are seven days from Super Bowl Sunday of all Sundays for the church, Resurrection Sunday, Easter, which by the way, if you've said yes to Jesus, every day is Resurrection Day, come on. But we are going to celebrate that next week, and we have five services that you can choose from next week. We're going to add one on Saturday night. Here are our service times. Uh, 4 o'clock, 5.30, 8.30, 10 a.m., 11.30 a.m., and then I'm going to sleep for about two days. But we're going to have a great time. Listen, I just want to help you out today because some of you, you are doing exactly what we've asked you to do. You're replying to us. You're RSVPing by texting Rock Creek to 94,000 to let us know which service you're coming to. It doesn't save you a seat. It just lets us know you're coming. So on the screen behind me, you're going to see the graph of what our services look like right now in this moment. And you'll notice that Saturday night's going to be a full house for both services. You'll notice your service right now still got a little bit of space. I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. And, and then uh, the hangover service, the 11.30 a.m. service, <laughs> is running a little bit behind. That's what I call it. Um, but it's running a little bit. But a lot of that's due to people have afternoon activities and they don't want to get out till 12.30. So if you don't have any activities... Uh, I would encourage you to come at 1130 next week. Looks like there's going to be plenty of seats or there might be, uh, that's just might be fibbing us, right? But uh, that's kind of where we're looking to land so far. So you choose your service, whichever one you want to come to. The, all the services are identical and we're going to have a great time. It's going to be an amazing, we've been working on it for months and we look forward to seeing you in the place next week weekend. Also, just let me throw something else out. Um, next weekend, being that it is going to be five services, and we're expecting probably somewhere between 4,500 and 5,000 people to be on our campuses on those. I know, how do we do that? I, we need a bigger building. Um, so we're working on it. We're working on it. We're hoping by June 1st, folks, for dirt to turn. June 1st. Start praying June 1. So, so with that being said, I just want to tell you today, if you're in the room, I just want to let you know you have a better chance of going to heaven. If you're not currently serving, if you would serve next weekend. <laughs> I was told this week by our team that we need a lot more kids ministry volunteers, but we need a lot more guest service ministry volunteers, like upwards to more than 50 more guest services. So it's really simple. You can take your phone out right now and you can text the word Rock Creek to 94,000 and we'll get you plugged in this week, our team will, so that you can serve next weekend. Now listen, we're just asking you to serve one weekend. If you're not serving, you're swerving, come on. And so we just want to help you out. We want you not to swerve for Jesus, right? So uh, if you'll serve next weekend, it'll help people meet and follow Jesus. Trust me, we won't rope you into doing more than just one weekend. Maybe. Okay, but uh, we want to encourage you to be a part of that. So if you'd help us out, if you'd be willing to serve next weekend, one service, two services, maybe three, and attend one, just let us know by doing that. We're super excited, and, and I think it'd be appropriate to pray over Easter right now, just to pray, God, through this week, that God would protect our team, that God would protect this place, and that we'd be prepared for a move of God next weekend, because he's going to move. And something miraculous is going to happen in this room next weekend. And so let's just pray and ask God to begin to bless it. Father God, we just come to you in this moment thanking you for everything we've already experienced in the room right now. Lord, it, your presence is here. 
And so we thank you for that. We thank you for the blood that's been applied. We thank you that we've been able to remember you through communion. But now, God, we just pray as we press into this coming weekend, Easter, that you prepare this house of worship, that your presence would be in this place all week getting ready to perform the greatest miracle of all time, bringing a spiritually dead boy, girl, or man or woman back to life. Lord, we praise you that because you live, we live. And because you live, we can face what tomorrow holds because we know you hold that day in your hand. Bless us now as we press into your, into your word. We are your servants. We are listening. Teach us today. Teach us from a familiar passage, something new and fresh. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, we're going to be in Mark chapter 6. If you want to grab your Bibles or smart devices, either open your Bible or turn on your Bible. We're going to be in Mark chapter chapter 6, and we're going to wrap up this series today that we've called Skeptic. We've been talking about this now for four weekends. Have you enjoyed this series? That's great. I I, I mean, when you ask that question, some people may shout no, you know, but uh, everybody online cheered. So um, we're going to wrap it up today, and and here's why we did this series is because um, our theme this year at Easter is Believe. And so we wanted to lead up to that with some people who had a really hard time in Scripture believing that Jesus who was who he said he was and would do what he said he would do. And so that leads into Easter. And so we've looked at a a few things. Week one, we looked at what is truth. Week two, um, the myth of this idea that God couldn't use us. And then last week, we looked at this guy named Nicodemus, who's kind of like the poster child of all skeptics in the New Testament. And today we're going to press in in, in a little further, and we're not going to look at an individual today. This is crazy. We're going to look at an entire town, an entire city of people that were skeptics of Jesus, an entire community that did not believe Jesus was who he said he was and didn't believe Jesus could do what he said he could do because they knew Jesus when he was a boy. How many of you know sometimes it's hard to see people as great when you've seen them in diapers? Right? And so we're going to see Jesus go back to where he grew up. And we're going to see an interesting account of this trip back to this place called Nazareth that's filled with skeptics, filled with unbelief. And we're going to find something really interesting. And although you and I weren't there that day, we're there. Because it so relates to our day. In 2002, um, Sarah and I had the opportunity to to move back to where I think is the greatest place on planet Earth, North Texas. Um, We had been gone from this area for 10 years. Um, We had done ministry for three years in West Texas. Can I tell you, North Texas looks nothing like West Texas. Uh, West Texas, there are no trees. There's literally a town in West Texas called No Trees, Texas. It's crazy. Um, the dust is always there, and, and, and when we got the opportunity to go to Abilene, Texas, we jumped on the opportunity because God had called us to ministry, and we went there for three years and had great ministry for three years, but then God delivered us from West Texas and moved us to probably the second most beautiful place on planet Earth other than right here. He took us to the Ozarks, Springfield, Missouri in particular, the Ozark Mountains, about 30 miles north of Branson. Everybody knows where Branson, Missouri is. And so we were on a ministry staff there where I was the associate pastor and the worship pastor there at a church for six years. And so we had been gone a total of 10 years from this area when I got a call from a pastor who offered me a position of associate pastor and worship pastor at the church that I grew up in as a child. The church that I got saved at when I was 12 years old. The church that I surrendered to ministry at when I was 16. And the church that that girl and I got married in when we were 22. I got a chance to come home. And we were so excited to come back home because of family. We wanted our kids to be around family. And we were so excited to get to come back. We'd been gone for 10 years. And I just knew coming back home, everybody at my home church was just going to love me. They were going to love some me of me, right? They were going to be so excited that the the golden child had come back home. (laughs) Only to find shortly after I arrived that most of the people, especially those that were counselors in the student ministry when I was a teenager, were a little bit skeptic of my call to ministry. 
they doubted that I was really the best person for the job. And, and, and here's what, I'd been gone 10 years, and so in that 10 years that I'd been gone, a lot of new people had come to that church that didn't know me as a kid. So I just hung out with them. Because the, some of the other ones, I couldn't convince, right? Hey, even my own father, who was a member of mom and dad, me and a member, even my own dad was a little skeptical. He's like, I raised him. I'm a little skeptical, right? How many of you can testify today, you know, sometimes it's a little hard to go home. Sometimes it's hard to go home. How many of you know that sometimes those who doubt you greatly are those that know you intimately? Those who will be skeptic of you to higher levels are people that know you at deeper links, that they really know everything about you. Hey, how many of you know sometimes it's hard to even convince family that Jesus has done something in your life? Yeah. The same is true for Jesus in this text. We're going to see the same is true. Now, I, I'm not trying to relate the story to me. I, I, listen, the story is about Jesus, not about me. But I'm just trying to apply it because I think all of us can understand what it's like to be rejected by those who know us the best. Look at verse 1. Let's pick it up there. Verse 1 in Mark chapter 6. Jesus left that part of the country. Now, now if you're taking notes today, just, just write down Capernaum because that's where he's at. And you're going to need to know he's in Capernaum because there's a big difference between Capernaum and Nazareth. But he's leaving Capernaum and he returned with his disciples. And if you underline in your Bible, underline that phrase with his disciples because that's very important to the lesson today. He returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. Now, when he gets to Nazareth, back to his hometown, I guess the next Sabbath day, whichever one was next, uh, they invited him to be the guest speaker that day in the Sabbath, uh, in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And so verse 2 says, the next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. In fact, they were so amazed, they asked, hey, where did he get all this wisdom? Because we knew him before. So like, he wasn't that smart when he left. Where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? It's going so well for Jesus, is it not? He's teaching and they're like, wow. But look at verse 3 because quickly the narrative changes. Then they scoffed. They turned from amazement to being annoyed pretty quickly, like in one verse. They scoffed and look what they said. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. Now, this has nothing to do with the sermon, but somebody needs to hear this today, or maybe someone online needs to hear this today. Mary wasn't a virgin after she gave birth to Jesus. That's important that you understand that, that, that J Jesus had half brothers and sisters, and their daddy is Joseph, but daddy of Jesus is God the Father, right? He was sent from heaven. So, so they have the same mama, but they don't have the same father because Jesus has always been. He wasn't created. He's always been. He was there at the day of creation, and so he came from heaven. So, so I just want to make that clear that Jesus has siblings, and so you got to kind of put the pieces together, right? And if you're under the age of 15 in here, you can talk to your parents about that later, okay? <laughs> it goes on to say, they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. They're, they're now offended. They're not annoyed. They're offended. And then verse 4, Jesus told them, and this became kind of my life verse for those six years of being on staff at my home church. A prophet is, is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own family. Now look at verse 5. And because of their unbelief, whose unbelief? The people of Nazareth. Because of their unbelief, not because Jesus couldn't, but because of their unbelief, Jesus couldn't do any miracles among them to, other than maybe place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. It's a complete oxymoron. Nowhere else in the Bible do you see Jesus not being able to do something. But he couldn't do something in Nazareth. He had the power to do it, but he couldn't do it because of their unbelief. And then look at verse 6. And now Jesus is amazed. They were amazed. Then they were annoyed. And look, Jesus was amazed. And he was not amazed because they were super spiritual. He was amazed at their 
unbelief. Let's talk about Nazareth for a minute because you got to get the context of this, this story. What is Nazareth? Where is Nazareth? What's the deal with Nazareth? Well, just so you know, Jesus wasn't born in Nazareth. Like we just celebrated that three months ago. Jesus was born. It's not a trick question. Where was he born? Bethlehem. So he's born in Bethlehem, but he's raised in Nazareth. This is why his name is referred to as Jesus of don't you feel so much smarter? Like you're a theologian right now. Hey, I know why Jesus was called Jesus of Nazareth. Because he was from Nazareth. So deep. Nazareth is an interesting place. It's an interesting place, and it is completely different than the place that Jesus has left when he went home. It's different than Capernaum. There's 25 miles that separate the two, but isn't it interesting when Jesus decided to launch his ministry, he didn't do it in his hometown. He went 25 miles away to the north side of the Sea of Galilee to a place called Capernaum, a place that is the most, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to. Uh, Capernaum is, when you walk into the town of Capernaum, literally there's a sign that says the hometown of Jesus. And you can stand in Capernaum and you can look just a little bit to your left and you can see the Mount of Beatitudes where Jesus spoke, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's amazing. You can see the Sea of Galilee, the shores from Capernaum where potentially Jesus called Andrew and Peter to be his disciples, and James and John as they were fishers, and he changed them from fishing for fish to fishing for men. It's a beautiful place. In fact, there is a massive stone at the entrance of Capernaum that says the trail of the gospel. This is where it all started. And so here's why I'm telling you this, because you need to know, Jesus didn't go back to Nazareth because things were going bad in Capernaum. His fame is at an all-time high in Capernaum. Guys, guys, multitudes are flocking to him in, 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 in Capernaum. I mean, miracles are happening. The Sermon on the Mount is happening. Disciples are being called. It's not like things are bad. He doesn't even go back home because he's going to check on mom and the siblings. He, he doesn't need a warm cooked meal from mom or a, a nice place to pillow his head at night. It, it has nothing to do with that. He's going back to Nazareth with a purpose. By the way, Jesus always does stuff with a purpose. Uh, write this down. We know that he has a purpose for going back because, I told you to underline this, he took his disciples with him. Some of you are already bored with this sermon, but you've got to hang on because I'm going to blow your mind, okay? I know, it's taken me a while to get there. Give me some grace. See, See, if it... If it didn't have a purpose, if he was just going back to see mom, he'd have left the disciples in Capernaum to carry on the ministry. He'd have been like, guys, I'm just going to go home. I'm homesick. I want to go see mama. And I'm going to go get a good home-cooked meal for a couple days, and then I'll be back. You guys carry on. But he takes the disciples back with him because, watch this, it's a training session for them. You, everything that they experienced in their three years of G, with Jesus, everything they experienced with Jesus was training them. Because there was going to come a day after the resurrection that there was going to be a day of ascension. And Jesus was going to leave planet earth. And in his absence, he had to make sure they had the DNA and the fortitude to carry on the gospel to get it to the ends of the earth. He was going to give to them the great commission. You know why it's called commission? Because it's us and him. And it's him and us. That's why it says co-mission. Not the great mission, the co-mission. And so he was going to rely on these guys to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth so that you and I could hear it, so that you and I could be forgiven, so that you and I could be redeemed. And he's got to train them on some things so that they can do it in the face of, watch this, rejection. By the way, you go out into any public square right now. You can talk about God all day long, and people won't give you a hard time. But the moment you drop the name Jesus, the whole conversation gets crazy. And rejection comes because you're talking about Jesus. And he needs them to know they're going to face rejection. And so what's the best way to show them how to face rejection? He takes them to a place where he knows he will be rejected. And here's the thing, if you and I are disciples of Jesus, if we're claiming that we're fully devoted followers of Jesus, guess what you're called? You're called a disciple. And if you're a disciple, guess what Jesus is doing in your life every single day? Training you for your next step with him. This is a good sermon, trust me, it's good. He's training you. He's training. You think right now you're going through a storm and you're asking why? 
Why? Why? And Jesus is wanting you to say, why not? What are you trying to teach me, Jesus? Right now, something's not going the way you would want it to go. So right now, you're living in tension, maybe in a relationship. There's a struggle, and there's something Jesus needs you to learn in that struggle. And maybe that thing that he needs you to learn is you need to put yourself on the shelf. And you need to press into Jesus and be more like him. Because you know what more like him looks like? Humility. And so, so he's, he's training you as a disciple, as a fully devoted follower of sin. And he's, he's in this journey training you. And here's the thing. Yes, you're not on the pages of Scripture. Yes, you're not in this story. Yes, the story's not about me and it's not about you. It's about Jesus and the disciples. But come on, it applies to you because you're a disciple. So write them down. Here they are. Number one, Jesus cannot override the unbelief of people he wants to heal, serve, and save. He cannot override Did you see it? It said Jesus could not do many miracles except to lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. Why? Did Jesus lose power between Capernaum and Nazareth? Did like a 25-mile journey through the mountains all of a sudden make him lacking in power? No. He couldn't override their unbelief. You see, one of the most beautiful things that God has given us as human beings is this thing called free will. The opportunity to choose. Because, listen, if God made us robots, we wouldn't really love him because we wouldn't be choosing to love him. He would make us love him. It's called free will. And so in this moment right now, some of you need healing. Jesus wants to heal some of you. It may not be physical, maybe a spiritual healing. So right now, Jesus wants to serve some of you, right? Right now, some, some of you, Jesus wants to heal your marriage. He wants to heal that wayward child that hasn't come home. He wants to heal your finances. He wants to heal all kinds of jacked up stuff in your life. Listen, he will not override your unbelief. You have to choose to believe rather than reject because he won't override it. These, these people, these people in Nazareth, they're good people. They're just like you and me. But isn't it interesting that we see Jesus unable to do something and Jesus amazed all at the same time? And it's predicated on their unbelief, their lack of faith. Write this down. There is something Jesus wants to do for people that he cannot do because what is inside people. This idea that Jesus doesn't perform miracles anymore. That somehow, some way, Jesus is out of the miracle-working business. There are people at Rock Creek that, that, that believe that. that. There are people that attend church here that are great with God the Father, great with God the Son, but they wig out when you start talking about the power of the Holy Spirit who has the power to heal. Because the Holy Spirit is the presence of Jesus right now on this planet Earth. He's, he's our... He's our. He's our connection to God the Father. He, he's with us everywhere we go. And, and, and listen, people are like, are we, really, are we really singing that song about breathe miracles? Can we really breathe miracles? Listen, I've seen 76 people baptized a month ago that are the miracle of all miracles. But beyond that, I've seen marriages put back together. I've seen divorce papers ripped up. I've seen people get out of debt. I've seen kids be reached that we thought, oh my gosh, they're like the, they're like the spawn of Satan. And their lives have been changed. I've watched our marriage grow. I've watched our kids' lives grow. I've watched so many of you be healed because you pressed in to belief and you rejected this idea of unbelief that Jesus isn't in a powerful working business today. But unbelief, unbelief will stop that power. Not because he can't, but because you won't allow it. Second thing, write this down. Jesus was rejected by those who were the most familiar with him. Isn't that interesting? The people that knew him best rejected him the most. In fact, in John chapter 1, here's how it's written. Verse 10, he came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. Verse 11, he came to his own people, and even they rejected him. Jesus was rejected by those who knew him the best. So let's go back to Nazareth for a minute because you got to see this. Jesus is in this synagogue on the Sabbath and he's preaching, he's teaching. More than likely, Jesus is reading from the scroll of Isaiah. And they are amazed. 
I mean, he's like blowing their minds, right? Can you imagine Jesus standing on this stage preaching? Online would just explode. We'd break the internet, right? That's what they're receiving that day. Jesus, God in the human flesh teaching them. And they're amazed. But somewhere along the way in his teaching, I don't know who it is. I don't know if it's a dude. I don't know if it's a dudette. But someone in the crowd says, wait, 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 hey, hey. Isn't he one of us? I mean, it, didn't he grow up in our youth ministry? Didn't he sing in the choir? I, I do believe he was in our nursery. He was in our kids' ministry at one time. He, isn't he one of us? And when they said, isn't he one of us, watch this, they put the title of common on the divine. Let me prove it to you. You're like, that's not in the Bible, Pastor. Yes, it is. Watch this. That's the carpenter. See, when they said, hey, isn't that the carpenter? Isn't that, isn't that the carpenter? That, that made him common just like them. Uh, watch this. This is going to blow your mind. Hey, isn't that Mary's son? Isn't that? You know, that is so inappropriate to say in Jewish custom. You would never refer to someone as the son of their mother. I'm going to show you that in a minute. But you would always, you should, they should have said, isn't that the son of Joseph? Which, by the way, they know his name. They know his name is Jesus. But they're referring to him as a carpenter and the son of his mother. Now, now before you give the people of Nazareth a hard time, let's, let's, let's stop there. Nazareth is a small town. Like, in this day and time, Nazareth is probably somewhere around 200 to 350 people. How many of you grew up in a small town? Come on, don't be ashamed of it. Okay, let me ask. How many of you are a small town girl looking or living in a lonely world? How's that one? All right. All right. I grew up in a small town before we moved to Texas. The town I, that we moved from when we moved to Texas when I was 12, 606 people. Small town. Let me tell you about small towns in case you don't know. Small towns are social media on steroids. If you want to know anything, just go to the barber shop or the beauty shop, okay? That was my hometown. This is Nazareth. And because it's a small town, this is maybe why they said, hey, 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 isn't this the son of Mary? Because there had been some rumors through the years about who Jesus' daddy was. You see, Mary came and said, well, listen, um, <laughs> What is in me is God. It's conceived of the Holy Spirit. I'm a virgin, and yet I'm pregnant. And they're like, sure. Whatever, Mary. Notice when the angel told her that she would give birth to a child and it would be the Son of God. Notice that the angel did not deliver a DNA test or a pregnancy test that would prove who the father was. So there's that whole father issue that's been going around town for some time. A little controversial. So maybe that's why we, they referred to him as the son of Mary. But either way, they put commonality on him to the point that they scoffed. And their familiarity with, with him removed their amazement of him. By the way, we all know familiarity breeds contempt. But it also breeds complacency. Here, here's the correlation. I think sometimes the church, not the world, I think sometimes the church, and I'm not talking about the building, I'm talking about you and me, that we're so familiar with Jesus that we've lost the amazement of Jesus. I, I, we, live in a, we live in a land where there's a church on every corner. We don't need you, Jesus. We got great worship. We don't need you, Jesus. Have you heard our pastor preach? <laughs> we don't need you, Jesus. Have you seen our kids, men? Wait till we get that new building, Jesus. Everybody's coming. Yeah. Man, we can't get so familiar with Jesus that we lose the amazement of Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you, if anything good happens in this place, it's Jesus. It's all Jesus. It's always been Jesus. And it wasn't what he did in the moment that made them doubt. They doubted because of where he came from. 
Oh, this is so good. Obviously, Nazareth has a reputation. Or they wouldn't doubt that something amazing could come from them. Let me prove it to you. When Jesus begins to call his disciples, we see him call Andrew. Andrew finds his brother Peter. And then he calls James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. And then he calls a guy named Philip. And then Philip goes and finds a guy named Nathaniel that some of you would know as Bartholomew. He had an alias. This guy named Nathaniel. Look at this in John chapter 1. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come follow me. And Philip was, born, was from Bethsaida, and Andrew and Pe- that was Andrew and Peter's hometown. Now Philip went to look for our boy Nathaniel. And he told him, watch, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus. The son, oh, look at this. The son of Joseph. See the honor? See the respect? See the divine versus the commonality? The son of Joseph. Now watch this, from Nazareth. Now don't, don't go to the next verse, media team, because i got to set this up. When I read you this next verse, and I wrote this sermon, in my mind I heard the next verse in my best Allen Iverson voice. Are you ready? Some of you are like, who's Allen Iverson? You're going to get it, those of you that know. You ready? Go to the next verse. Nazareth? Practice? We're talking practice, man. We're not talking the game. We're talking practice, man. Nazareth? Now look at the next thing that Nathan says. Can anything good come from Nazareth? There's a reputation. And not only do people in Capernaum know, but the people living in Nazareth know. And there's no way that this Jesus could be everything we might think or hope he could be because he is one of us. See, I I think they doubted not because Jesus didn't have the power. I think they doubted because they didn't believe in themselves. (laughs) They equated their Nazareth to him. See, they were trapped in a mentality of Nazareth. Let me help somebody today right now, and i got to hurry. Somebody right now, you're thinking there is no possible way, no possible way that God would ever choose to use me because you don't know what my dad did to me. No way Jesus could use me. You don't know who my mom was. See, see, you're equating the power of Jesus in your mess in your life. And I'm just telling you, the power of Jesus takes messes and makes miracles. He makes miracles. But you got to choose to step out of the trap of Nazareth. you got to choose to lay your baggage down. Stop being a skeptic of him because you're a skeptic of you. Comparison is the worst trap you'll ever fall into. The only one we compare ourselves to is Jesus, and last time I checked, I got a lot of work to do. Let me give you this third one. Robert's already playing, and I'm not even on the third point. (laughs) When you become familiar with Jesus, often you will miss the power of Jesus. Jesus said, a prophet is without honor in his hometown and among his relatives and his family. Write this down. What is consistently taken for granted is eventually taken away. You know, one of my biggest fears for Rock Creek Church is people take for granted what God is doing at Rock Creek. That somehow you're going to walk in here and every Sunday it's going to be like this. Every Sunday you're going to experience God. Listen, don't take it for granted. It's special. It's amazing. Don't take it for granted. Come with anticipation. Because it could all be gone tomorrow. Because what is taken for granted is usually taken away. 
Don't get so used to Jesus in your life that you're no longer honoring him in your family and in your home. Don't let the prophet Jesus, the Messiah, the resurrected Savior, be without honor in your life and your home. Don't let that be the story of you. See, I, I'm afraid. Stay with me. I'm almost done, I promise. I'm afraid that the revival that we so long for in our nation is going to come when those who say they follow Jesus stop putting restrictions on the power of Jesus. Let me give you an example. If you, if a year or two ago, there was a revival that broke out at Asbury. You guys know about that. And people were emailing me saying, Pastor, we need to get in a car or we need to get on a plane and go experience the revival in Asbury. My reply to them was, no, you don't. Let Asbury be Asbury. Ask him to do it here, where you're at. Ask him to do it here. Recently, we see where revival broke out at Liberty University in Virginia. We don't need to get in a car and drive to Virginia. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to break out in all power here and bring revival here because he wants to. He wants to. Let me, let me go a little further. People ask me all the time, Pastor, why are you so passionate about the mission field? I mean, we got enough work to do across the street. You're right. You're right. But I was told to get the gospel to the ends of the earth, right? So I'm very passionate about fulfilling the, all of the Great Commission. But the reason why I love to go to the mission field, Dominican Republic, Africa, South America, Guatemala, Philippines. Listen, because when I go there, I get a glimpse of what the American church is lacking. God is on the move all over the world, guys. All over the world. There's healings going on all over the world. And I'm going to tell you, when you're in the Dominican Republic, you don't have to deal with all the distractions of the American culture. They're not talking about the things we're talking about. You know why? Because they don't have time because they're trying to figure out where their next meal's coming from. They're not spending all day on YouTube trying to figure out if this conspiracy is true or this conspiracy is true. They're on mission with God. And their belief is fully in Him rather than being distracted by the enemy. And they've pressed fully in Him. And when we go there, it's like, oh, I want that so bad at Rock Creek. I want that. And here's what Jesus wants you to know today. You can have it. You can have it. But you have to step out of Nazareth. Because some of you are trapped in Nazareth. Write this down and I'm done. This is the best one. This is it today. This is, this is everything right here. You ready? Because you need to know this, disciples. Here's what the lesson is. This is the entirety of the sermon. The road to the resurrection will always be paved with bricks of rejection. Okay, I'll say amen. Amen. The road to the resurrection will always be paved with bricks of rejection. It will be. See, Jesus is telling us this narrative. We're, we're seeing this and the resurrection. The crucifixion hasn't even happened yet. He's already training his disciples. You better know how to handle rejection. Because it's required to get to the resurrection. And so here's what I want to tell you today. If you're facing rejection right now, you're in a mess, you're, you're feeling opposition from the enemy every single day, the kids are driving you nuts, the, there's more month than there is money, your marriage is hanging on by a thread, why do you think the enemy's fighting so hard against you right now? Because you're going the opposite direction. If you're going the same direction as the enemy, he don't mess with you. And you better be willing to face rejection. But on the other side, there's a resurrection. And it's coming next weekend. Come on. It's coming next weekend. So, Father, we just thank you so much for this story in Mark 6 where we can see a story out of the life of Jesus and his disciples that, yeah, we're not there, but, boy, it sure does apply right now where we are. 
And I pray that Rock Creek would never be a church that would limit you because we see all the imperfections in us. God, your power is not predicated on our imperfections. It's predicated on our belief and our faith that you can still work miracles. So we ask for revival just right here. Move in a powerful way as we press into Resurrection Weekend. Bring revival and let it start in me. Because I move away from Nazareth in my unbelief. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I've kept you way too long. Sorry. There are prayer team members down front if you need prayer. Other than that, I'll see you next weekend. Come ready to go on Easter Sunday. God bless you guys.